Hi everyone, it's Dr. A, and in this video, we'll be investigating the electron transport chain, which is also referred to as the electron transport system. And along with this, we'll investigate an important sequence of events called oxidative phosphorylation. Just as a quick review from our previous process, which was the citric acid cycle, here are our end products. We end up with two ATP, 6 NADH, 2 FADH2, and 4 molecules of carbon dioxide. One of the things that's helpful to note is that the electron transport system, or chain, occurs within the mitochondria. So let's investigate once again the mitochondria's components. First, we have the outer membrane, which acts as a protective barrier, regulating the structures that are allowed to enter. In general, it permits smaller molecules to enter, while larger molecules can only enter via specialized protein channels. Secondly, we have the inner membrane, which can be described as a phospholipid bilayer located inside of the mitochondria, which forms what we call cristae. Between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, we have the intermembrane space. And last but not least, we have the mitochondrial matrix, which is the innermost component of the mitochondria that has a gel-like substance that contains enzymes, DNA, ribosomes, and other important molecules. So as we zoom into our mitochondria, here's what we have. We begin with our cytoplasm, which represents the jelly-like substance that fills the space between the cell membrane and the nucleus. Within the cytoplasm, we have our fluid portion, which is mostly made of water and contains ions, small molecules, and large molecules, such as proteins and enzymes. As we make our way to the mitochondria, we have its outer membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer. Following this, we have the intermembrane space, which we identified earlier as simply the space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And next is our inner membrane space, which is our row of folds or cristae. And within this membrane, we have enzymes, which are often referred to as complexes. And last but not least, we have the innermost portion of the mitochondria, the mitochondrial matrix. Now, coupled with this, we have several enzymes embedded within the inner membrane of the mitochondria. The first is appropriately referred to as complex 1, or NADH dehydrogenase. The second is complex 2, or succinate dehydrogenase. The third is complex 3, or cytochrome BC. And next is complex 4, or cytochrome C oxidase. And lastly, we have complex 5, which is better known as ATP synthase. We also have some additional structures that we have not yet identified. The first is called coenzyme Q, which acts as a relay station, transporting electrons from one complex to another. Also, we have another structure referred to as cytochrome C, which also acts as a relay station, transporting electrons from one complex to another. In our first step of the electron transport chain or system, we'll have the NADH molecules that we've been gathering through glycolysis and the citric acid cycle bind to complex 1. And as it binds, it transfers the electrons it's been carrying to the complex itself. And once that's done, our NADH is now oxidized and becomes NAD. And one of the things we should think about is that the movement of electrons is like electricity. And because of this, we can say that complex one becomes highly charged. And as a result, it's able to transfer the protons that are present within the mitochondrial matrix. Now, it's helpful to note that they're available largely because of the chemical reactions that took place during both glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. So, now that complex 1 is charged, it acts as a proton pump, moving our protons from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. As a result of the movement of these protons, we begin to create what's called a proton gradient which means that we're building up a higher concentration of protons in the intermembrane space 
than we are in the mitochondrial matrix. And as part of the second step, this proton gradient builds and the electrons within complex 1 transfer to coenzyme Q, where they reside temporarily. Afterwards, we'll have FADH2, which we acquire from the citric acid cycle, attached to complex 2, and similarly releasing its electrons into the complex. And after their release, our FADH2 becomes FAD. Now, one of the things that's helpful and important to note here is that complex 2 does not function as a proton pump in the way complex 1 does. Instead, these electrons are passed along to coenzyme Q. For step 3 of our process, the electrons that have been transferred to coenzyme Q are passed along to complex 3. And as they make their way to complex 3, complex 3 becomes highly charged and is now able to function as a proton pump much in the same way complex 1 did. Again, moving protons from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space, which allows us the opportunity to continue building on the proton gradient that's been established. For step 4 of our process, the electrons that are present at complex 3 will transition to cytochrome C and are ultimately passed along to complex 4, which again allows complex 4 to become highly charged allowing for more protons to be pumped from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space, which again continues to build this proton gradient we've been witnessing. For step 5, and now that our electrons are gathered at complex 4, we reach the end of what we should reference as the electron transport chain or system. And the last act of this process is when our electrons reach the final electron receptor, which is oxygen, and will find oxygen within the mitochondrial matrix. And it's through a subsequent reaction that we will have the formation of two water molecules. So now that we've concluded with the electron transport chain or system, the final piece is what we'll refer to as oxidative phosphorylation. And here's what's happening. Now that we have this sizable proton gradient between the intermembrane space and the mitochondrial matrix, will have the opportunity to create a large amount of ATP molecules. So to begin, we start with ADP making its way to channel 5, or the ATP synthase channel. So what this ATP synthase channel will do is utilize the proton gradient that's been generated, causing the protons to move down their concentration gradient, which allows the protons to move from where they are high in number, the intermembrane space, to where they are low in number, the mitochondrial matrix. And it's a chemical interaction now between ADP and our protons that is able to generate a generous amount of ATP molecules. So let's take a moment to review a brief summary of the events from the electron transport system and oxidative phosphorylation. NADH attaches to complex 1, donating its electrons and pumping protons from the mitochondrial matrix into the intermembrane space. The electrons from complex 1 are transferred to coenzyme Q. Next, FADH2 attaches to complex 2 and donates its electrons to it. Complex 2 donates the electrons it's carrying to coenzyme Q then to complex 3. Complex 3 then pumps protons from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space. The remaining steps include the electrons present at complex 3 being passed along to cytochrome C, and ultimately to complex 4, which then pumps protons from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space. It is our electrons at complex 4 which allow it to reach the end of the electron transport system and interact with oxygen, which is our last electron receptor, creating water molecules as a byproduct. The final step is then oxidative phosphorylation, which occurs when our protons are shuttled down their concentration gradient into the ATP synthase channel that it then combines with ADP to make ATP. Now, one of the things we've been diligent in doing for each component or phase of cellular respiration 
is detailing our end products. And now that we're at the end, we'll do the same with some added explanation. Typically, at the conclusion of cellular respiration and when oxygen is fully available, we end up with roughly between 30 to 32 molecules of ATP from one glucose molecule. The variation in ATP for cellular respiration comes about because of a variety of factors like the efficiency of the complexes we come across within the electron transport system, which can be influenced by cellular conditions and oxygen availability, ultimately leading to fluctuations in the amount of ATP generated.